بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وعلى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Continue with the shamail of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم as brilliantly and beautifully compiled by Imam Tirmidhi رحمه الله تعالى. The next several chapters which we are going to go through are in regards to the combat attire of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. The sword of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What was it made out of? How was it? Uh, what, what material uh, uh, was it? Etc. Um, the armor of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The helmet of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Chapter number fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. These chapters being brief in essence, but a few things that we understand from these type of chapters. Uh, rather, this this entire this this, uh, this compilation its entirety. How much love the companions had for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that's something which was unparalleled. An individual who loves his family, an individual who loves his spouse, uh, an individual who loves her, her husband. Um, they hold on to these particular type of mem memories. Right, um, when an individual gets married, uh, the wife remembers every explicit detail. The husband remembers every explicit detail in regards to um, perhaps the first time that they met, perhaps the type of clothes that the husband was wearing or the wife was wearing. These things are typically remembered because of the love and the and the bond that you have, the connection that you have between yourself and the other person. The companions had an even stronger bond with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? As we understand through these narrations that we're seeing, that not only are they remembering that particular detail that perhaps they're being asked about, but they remember the entire setting when they saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was wearing perhaps his shoes, when they saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was applying Quran, when they saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or how many white hairs the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, and where were they, right? Uh, on his beard, where were they? On his head, where were they? How many did he have? All these small details being remembered about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shows that the love that they have had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And number two, we understand from these particular chapters, the armor, the sword, the helmet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that wearing these things or utilizing these things, an individual may say, isn't this going against the will and the decree of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Isn't this going against placing your trust in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Why should a, an individual wear his armor or, or they used to wear armor, a hand-to-hand -hand combat war to protect his vital organs, right? Individual may say that if, it, if you're going to die, you're going to die. Why do you have to adorn these type of things? Why do you have to take these precautions or these preventive measures, right? In our particular uh, context, um, social distancing, uh, perhaps when we're praying, we're leaving a, a, a gap between each other. Why do we have to do that? And putting aside the, the, the ruling, the, 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 the basis of it, but just in general speaking, why should an individual wear a mask? Why should an individual not shake hands? Why should an individual not do this? Why should he do that? Right? If we're going to die, we're going to die. If we're going to... Uh, get the virus, we're going to get the virus. You know, why do we got to do all this? Isn't this going against the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Isn't this going against placing our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. No, it's not. The Prophet sallallahu himself wore armor. The Prophet himself wore a helmet. The Prophet sallallahu himself owned multiple swords. Rather, Ibn Hisham, rahimahullah, he goes on to say 10 swords and he lists them by name as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about it. But the fact being that the Prophet Sallallahu utilized these things, utilized these things. To put it simply, in a form of an example, you take your car into, you go downtown of Salanti or downtown Detroit, 
Um, and a uh, brand new vehicle, you leave your car, you, the keys in the ignition, you leave the windows open, rather you leave it unlocked and you know it's an area where crime rates are high. Um, and you tell yourself that, you know, if it's going to get stolen, it's going to get stolen. It's out of my hands. That would be foolishness. Everyone will call you a fool. Everyone will call you a fool. You lock your car, you take the keys with you, you try parking in an area which is not, you know, the crime rates aren't that high. And if anything happens, then it happens. And you leave that in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That in essence is the proper understanding of tawakkul and the proper understanding of placing your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believing in the destiny uh, 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 of Allah subhanahu, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has will. Similarly, the Prophet is wearing a helmet, the Prophet is wearing armor. Whatever you can possibly do, whatever is in your capability, you do. Whatever you can possibly do, you do, and that's it. That's, it. that's the correct understanding of tawakkul. That's a correct understanding of believing in the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These chapters being short in, in, in essence, but extremely detailed. And from this, we understand the actual love that the companions had with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the 14th chapter, in regards to the sword of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Anas al-Malik radiyallahu anhu, he goes on to say that كانت قبيعة سيف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كانت قبيعة سيف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من فضة that the handle of the sword of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was made of silver. Next uh, uh, hadith being uh, عن سعيد بن أبي الحسن قالت قال كانت قبيعة سيف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من فضة. Similar hadith that the grip or the handle of the sword of the Prophet one is the blade part and one is the handle where you hold it from and you can wield it, you can maneuver it as you wish. That was <coughs> excuse me. That was made of silver. That was made of silver. Um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sword, third hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sword when he entered the city of Mecca, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conquered Mecca, and we'll actually get into this uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the coming chapters as well. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sword is described, wa ala sayfihi dhahabun wa filtatun. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sword had gold and silver on it. However, this uh, hadith is, uh, is, is weak um, for, for a multitude of reasons. But nonetheless, فَسَأَلْتُهُ عَنْ فِضَّةٍ عَنِ الْفِضَّةٍ uh, One of the narrators of the hadith, Talib, uh, he asked his teacher, the one, who he is, the one who he is narrating from, on which part of the sword was silver, the prophet, and he replied, كَانَتْ قَبِيعَةُ سَيْفْ فِضَّةً the grip handle was made out of silver. Now, this particular hadith says that the, that the Prophet sword was made out of gold and silver. However, from the rest of the narrations, we understand that it was made just from silver. It was made just from silver. The grip was made from silver. Uh, this particular hadith, in essence, even being uh, weak, uh, Imam Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he brings it in his, in his, in his uh, sunan or his, in his jami' as well. Um, but it has been classified as weak for multitude of reasons. Ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, he goes on to say, Sana'atu Sayfi ala Sayfi Samarut bin Jundub, radiallahu anhu, that I made my sword, I made my sword like the sword of Samura bin Jundub, radiallahu anhu. And he said, Waza'ama Samura, annahu sana'a Sayfahu, على سيف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم that uh, وكان حنفيا that I made my sword he goes on I made my sword like the sword of Samura bin Jundu and he said that he had his sword made in the same exact manner as the one of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم 
And in order to describe the sword, he went on to say that this was a type used by the tribe of Banu Hanifa. Uh, their sword was such that it would be made out of two different type of elements, two different type of metal, so to say. Um, and it would be uh, uh, the grip handle being made out of silver, perhaps, and the, the remainder of it being made from a different, the, the blade or the sharp end of it being made from a different type of metal. This is the completion of, in regards to the sword of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As I mentioned, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a variety of different swords. Um, the scholars of Sirah have made mention of them by, by perhaps by name as well. Uh, however, in regards to issues like this, um, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows best in, in terms of the authenticity of it. As I mentioned, Ibn Hisham, rahimahullah, he mentions 10 different swords the Prophet owned throughout his life. Um, the reason why these swords were even given names, this was something very common in, in uh, with the Arabs. Um, animals were given names, camels, horses, mules, donkeys. Uh, armor was given names. Um, Swords were given names, helmets were given names, anything of value, so to say. Anything that an individual prided himself by would be given a name, uh, you, you, in short. Um, even now, actually, racehorses, um, not only are they given names, but just like the Arabs, they used to know the nasab of these particular animals. That uh, uh, this horse, um, was given birth by uh, so and so, and uh, it was you know the mother is this, the father is this, you know you know things like that. The nesib of the horses, even now like valuable horses, race horses, uh, competition horses, things like that. The the nesib of these animals are known as well because it's something that that, that is prided and, and something which is uh, which uh, which sets these animals apart, so to say. So this was very common that the, 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 they, they had names for their swords, name for their armors, name for their animals even. Um, but again, as I said, in regards to uh, uh, the, the swords of the Prophet Sallallahu the names of the swords of the Prophet Sallallahu nothing concrete uh, can be said. Uh, the various uh, uh, mentions of those names from um, the various books of Hadith um, be, be, being being many in number. Nonetheless, um, in regards to, I think we skipped a chapter. The armor of the Prophet sallallahu This chapter actually has only two narrations, uh, as does the, does the next chapter, if I'm not mistaken. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's armor in essence was, was, was extremely unique, was extremely unique. Rather, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore two suits of armor. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not wear one suit of armor. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore two suits of armor. Dira'an, jama'a baynahuma. He combined two, two different type of armor, so to say. وَلَبِسَ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى كَأَنَّهُ جَعَلَ إِحْدَاهُمَا بَاطِنَا وَأُخْرَى ظَاهِرًا the Prophet wore one on top of the other. So like full suits of armor, one, and then he wore another one. For example, like one was the a, was a, was a inner layer, and then the second was the outer layer. One was the inner layer, second was the outer layer. Rather, it was such that in the Battle of Uhud, as the first narration goes, I will understand, the weight of it was so heavy. The weight of it was so heavy. And not just that, the material of it actually... Um, it is not common to, to the type of material that we have now, right? Uh, not now we have lightweighted uh, um, fabrics or, or material which can be manipulated in such a way which serves as the body armor, so to say. Uh, but at that time, it would, li it would literally be steel. You're, you're using steel to protect you against steel. You're using steel or iron to protect you. You're using metal to protect you against metal. And not just that, when you're fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, 
you have to maneuver in, in a, you have to be light on your feet. You have to be fast. You have to be maneuvering. And that's why whichever army had more physical strength would come out on top. Whichever army had more physical strength would come out on top. But the battle of Uhud, the Prophet due to the weight of the armor, and the two armors, and the difficulties of the Prophet faced in the battle of Uhud, himself being injured, himself being bleeding. And not just that, the Prophet uh, uh, the rumor uh, spreading of the Prophet وسلم, has passed away. The Prophet وسلم, has been killed. And the morale of the companions being crushed, the morale of the companions being crushed, the Prophet saw an elevated place and he, 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 he intended to climb in order to, for the companions to be able to see the Prophet وسلم, perhaps boost their morale. But the Prophet وسلم, he tried to climb, but he could not do so. And then he asked Talha anhu, to sit. And with his aid, he climbed the hill. He, with his aid, he climbed the hill. At that time, the Prophet وسلم, said, O oh, Jabal Talha, O oh, Jabal Talha, uh, it has become wajib upon Talha, it has become necessary upon Talha, meaning Jannah, heaven, Jannah has been uh, obligatory, so to he has guaranteed his Jannah now. He has guaranteed his Jannah. Jannah has been guaranteed for Talha. So from this first narration, we understand that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Yawma Uhudin Dira'ani. He had two armors. The Prophet had two armors. And Issa ibn Yazid radiallahu anhu, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana alayhi yawma uhudin dir'ani, qad zahara baynahuma. In the battle of Uhud, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wore two suits of armor, qad zahara baynahuma, he wore one over the other. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wore one over the other, meaning one was the interior, inner layer, second was the outer layer. The helmet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, two narrations, <clears throat> both being similar um, in essence. Anas al Malik radiallahu anhu, he goes on to say, both of them being from Anas al Malik radiallahu anhu, in regards to when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam conquered Mecca. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was wearing a helmet. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we're just going to combine these two narrations. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was not in a state of ihram. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we know, there are certain miqats, in the certain areas where an individual cannot trespass, cannot, cannot, uh, um, cannot, uh, 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 I don't know if trespass is the proper, appropriate word, but an individual cannot pass the boundaries of the city of Mecca without being in the state of Ihram. Individual, if he's coming from outside, and we've gone over this in our fiqh of Hajj and Umrah, uh, but an individual cannot trust or an individual cannot pass the, those boundaries without being in the state of Ihram. The Prophet, وسلم, as we understand from the second hadith, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lam yakun yawma idhim muhariman The Prophet sallallahu was not in the state of Ihram. He's coming from the city of Medina, but he's not in the state of Ihram. From this we understand that uh, as, the, as the hadith of Bukhari goes such, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, lam tahillu li ahadin qabli wa la ba'di da'iman. It's not some, anything which is permissible for someone before me or after me ever to Pass this without being in the state of ihram. Hallat li sa'atan min naharin thumma aadat haram. It has been made permissible for me to come in this state for a short period of time during the day, and then it will return back to being something impermissible for all. It will return back to being impermissible for, for all. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, number one, he was wearing a helmet. Wa alayhi mighfarun. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was wearing a helmet. He was wearing a helmet. The companions came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, هذا ابن خطال خطل متعلق بأستار الكعبة ابن خطل, he is holding the cover of the Kaaba. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, kill him. 
Now, why did the Prophet ﷺ say, kill this particular individual? This individual was such. He embraced Islam. His name used to be Abdul Uzza. His name used to be Abdul Uzza. He embraced Islam. The Prophet ﷺ made him uh, an agent of him to go and collect the, the, the sadaqah or the zakah uh, from particular people. He took himself another companion, the Prophet and his servant. And as they're traveling, um, he, they, they stop to rest. And he tells the servant that, listen, we're going to rest. You stay away and you prepare the food for us. When we wake up, the food better be ready. They wake up, the food is not ready. He gets angry and he ends up killing this servant. He ends up killing this servant. Knowing that he has killed him unjustly, he flees. And he retreats towards Mecca. And not just that, he leaves the fold of Islam. He leaves the fold of Islam. And he starts slandering Islam, going against Islam, going against the Prophet Sallallahu writing poetry even against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hiring uh, singers who, 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 female singers who would sing uh, 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 against the Prophet, uh, you know, couplets and poetry against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his whole reason for fleeing was because he knew he unjustly killed this individual. And if an individual unjustly kills, what is the penalty for that in Islam? That he is killed in retaliation. Not just that, this individual left the fold of Islam. So the Prophet Sallallahu gave the command to kill him as well. To kill him as well. This is why this individual was killed. However, when the Prophet Sallallahu conquered Mecca, he conquered in a very peaceful way. Rather such, the example of Sufyan Radiallahu Anhu, who at that time was not a Muslim. Rather Imam Tabri Rahimullah, he goes on to say, Lam yakun Abu Sufyan, a rajul an aadi min al Quraysh. Abu Sufyan was not a was not a normal person from amongst the Quraysh. Uh, he was a man of much prom prominence, leadership. People would turn to him for guidance and direction. Uh, he was the leader of every anti-Islamic campaign right up to the conquest of Mecca. Uh, in the in the con in, in the Battle of Badr. Seven of the leaders of Quraysh lost their lives. This was obviously a big blow for the morale of the disbelievers. They came with the idea that this is going to be a walk in the park. After this, they came to, uh, they got together, pulled their resources together. And under the leadership of Sufyan, they launched a ferocious attack in different ways against the Muslims. Uh, rather, it was such that the son of Abu Sufyan, Ibn Hanzala, قد قتل في بدر, وابن الآخر عمر قد أسير, فزاد ذلك في أفغانه وأحقاده. Two things happened in the Battle of Badr, in addition to all these 70 who passed away, the leaders who passed away. Abu Sufyan's son Hanzala was killed. His other son, Amr, was captured by the Muslims. One was killed, second was captured by the Muslims. Abu Sufyan, he took a qasam. Allah yamassa ra'sahu ma min, min janaba hatta yaghzu Muhammad. Enraged him so much that I will never, I, I, will, I, I will not become intimate with my spouse until I do not take revenge upon Muhammad. Then comes the campaign of Uhud. Abu Sufyan goes with 3,000 strong. He's a leader, he's a general, he's a big shot. Abu Sufyan, قتل Abu Sufyan يومها سلمة بن ثابت رضي الله عنه وقيل أنه هو الذي قتل حنظل غصيل الملائكة He kills Salama bin, Salama bin Thabit رضي الله عنه and he kills حنظل who was washed by the malaika and we, we know his story and we'll not get into that right now and he stands up and he says حنظل بحنظل this حنظل is for my حنظل my son who died, this is in retaliation for that. Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, he goes on to report that Abu Sufyan, not just that, he, he stands up and he taunts the people. 
And he says, Afil Qomi Muhammad, is Muhammad alive? Like the Prophet says, don't respond to him. Then he says, Afil Qomi ibn Abi Quhafa, is Abu Bakr alive? The Prophet says, don't respond. He says, Umar ibn Khattab alive? The Prophet says, don't respond. And then he says, إِنَّ هَؤُلَاءِ قُتِلُوا فَلَوْ كَانُوا أَحْيَاءً لَأَجَابُوا These people have died. If they were alive, they would have the courage to respond. Umar bin Khattab cannot stay silent. He stands up and he says, كَذَبْتَ يَا عَدُوَ اللَّهِ You are lying, O enemy of Allah. أَبْقَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ مَا يُخْزِيكَ Since we have very little time, I have to summarize. But he goes on to praise his idols. He goes on to uh, 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 praise the idols uh, 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 which they used to associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah so tells them to respond, uh, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But nonetheless, this individual, he is against spearheading every campaign against Islam. As the Prophet conquers Mecca, what does the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu seeks protection for Abu Sufyan. The Prophet gives him protection. The Prophet gives him protection. No retaliation was taken that day. No personal retaliation was taken that day. So that was how the Prophet in short conquered Mecca. But this is the helmet, the sword, and the armor of the Prophet May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet وسلم, his manners, his conduct, his appearance, in whatever way we possibly can. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.